Hello and welcome. Today's lecture is about GTO versus exploitative poker. Now, most people, when they think of GTO and exploitative, they think these are opposite styles. They're adversarial, binary, you either do one or the other. But this couldn't be further from the truth. In my opinion, these two styles complement each other. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say one is blind without the other. There's no such thing as a truly exploitative player or a truly GTO player. Everyone's playing somewhere in between. And you can't really understand one without understanding the other. So in today's lecture, we're going to go over what is GTO, what is exploitative, We'll talk about nemesis strategies. We'll talk about how GTO actually makes money. And then we're going to follow up that with several toy game and real life examples to help you improve your play. So first, we need to answer the question of what is GTO and what is exploitative? GTO is a balanced play style that seeks to minimize its leaks. It conforms to the principles of Nash equilibrium, and it essentially tries to maximize a fixed strategy. Exploitative, on the other hand, is a dynamic playstyle that seeks to attack your opponent's imbalances. It adapts to different opponents, and it carries a risk of counter-exploitation. GTO is designed to be unexploitable, meaning that the best possible strategy against GTO is GTO. Exploitative, on the other hand, can potentially gain more versus an imbalanced opponent. However, for every risk you take, you also carry a risk of being counter-exploited. The further you stray from equilibrium, the bigger the risk and also the bigger the reward. Now, these two may seem adversarial, but they're two sides of the same coin. You see, GTO is informed by and created by the underlying potential exploitative dynamics. On the flip side, solid exploitative poker uses GTO as a baseline from which to recognize and attack imbalances. And you can never truly understand one strategy without understanding the other. You need at least some basic exploitative principles to understand where the solver is coming from, for, to understand why GTO works in the first place. And conversely, you need a solid baseline from which to recognize imbalances. So, for example, how can you say your opponent is too value heavy or too bluff heavy if you don't know what the correct amount of value heaviness is, right? You need some sort of common ground in order to recognize when your opponent is deviated from that. We need to understand how GTO strategies are made. And this is important to understanding what I mean by underlying potential exploitative dynamics. So start with two bots. We've got bot A and bot B, and we'll give them completely random strategies. They'll just pick every action at an equal frequency with every hand, you know, no regard for strategic poker at all. Now we're going to fix player A's strategy. What do I mean by this? I mean, we're going to lock that strategy in place so that they can't adapt. And we're going to let player B exploit that fixed random strategy. So they'll adjust to try and get the most out of player A. Now we're going to fix player B's new exploitative strategy and let player A exploit that. And then we're going to fix player A's new strategy and let player B exploit that and repeat this cycle over and over and over again until we approach Nash Equilibrium. As we do this, the potential to exploit A or B will decrease. We call this Nash distance. And as the Nash distance decreases, you approach equilibrium until you reach a point where no player can really exploit the other. So when I say underlying exploitative dynamics, what I mean is every GTO solution is built on top of a set of potential exploits these A and Bs going back and forth. And in order to understand why the GTO solution behaves as it does, you need to understand principles of exploitation. Which brings me to my next point. GTO is built on exploitative principles. So Nash Equilibrium states, no player can gain by unilaterally changing their strategy. In other words, when everyone's playing GTO, you cannot gain by deviating from GTO. So in order to solve the question, why does the solver do X? Why does it do the thing? You have to answer the question, because if it didn't do the thing, then the opponent can exploit them by doing this thing. Why does the solver do X? Because if it didn't, opponent can exploit by doing Y. And this is fundamental to all solver studies. So let's go over a very simple example. Here we've got a 500 NL cash game, small blind RFI chart. And we can see it opens a good chunk of its hands, but it's also mixing opens with several hands that have zero EV. Now, why on earth should you open a hand that adds literally zero EV to your strategy? Well, if small blind were to simply fold all of these zero EV hands, you know, king eight, eight, seven, ace four, jack three, five, three suited, if they were to just fold all of that, they're playing too tight. And what would happen is that big blind could adapt their strategy by playing a bit tighter, which would cost small blind value 
with the top of their range. Conversely, if all of these hands were opened, well, then Big Blind could adapt their strategy by continuing wider, raising and calling more, which would cost you value with the bottom of your range. And so the way to maximize the strategy is going to have some zero EV opens, right? And this is what I mean by the underlying exploitative dynamics. In order to understand why we open these hands, why you play any zero EV hands, you have to understand that if you don't do this, the opponent can adapt. Let's talk about exploitation for a moment. So I said earlier, exploitation is blind without a baseline. And I think a lot of players, particularly those that, you know, aren't really familiar with GTO will disagree with this. But the thing is, like I said earlier, how can you recognize if your opponent is too value heavy or bluffing too much if you can't identify the correct amount of value heaviness or bluffiness? What you're actually doing is you're playing by feel. You're playing according to feedback you receive from your particular player pool, which might be, you know, too passive or too aggressive or too loose or too tight or whatever. You're not identifying exploits correctly. What you're doing is you're applying a subjective opinion on what is the correct amount of, you know, top pair plus that they should have for this line versus their bluffs or whatever. And so what this does is it leads to a lot of misunderstandings about what correct play should look like. And it'll lead you to not only miss exploits, but misevaluate your opponent's range in a lot of spots. So how do you exploit correctly? Well, firstly, you need a baseline. That is the GTO strategy. You need to identify how they're deviating from that baseline. And as part of this step, you need to evaluate your confidence in your read. You can't just go gung ho based on, you know, the very slightest intuition without taking on a humongous amount of risk. So you do need to have some confidence in your read before you exploit correctly. Next, you need to ask yourself, why is this a mistake? Why is their deviation a problem? And then figure out how to increase that mistake. So let's go over a very simple river example so you can see what I mean. So this is a spin and go 25 big blind effective spot where button opens big blind calls. They've bet small on the flop on ace nine nine, big blind calls, checks to us on the turn. They've potted it on the turn, representing mostly trips plus some strong top bear and bluffs. And it checks to us on the river. So the strategy here is to value bet mostly trips plus your very strongest top pair and bluffs. So let's imagine that big blind is not bluffing enough. So we'll take a look at these trash hands here. They're not including enough of these weak hands in their river shoving range. They're just giving up. Okay, why is that a mistake? Well, if they're under bluffing, then we won't have the correct pot odds to call with a lot of these marginal bluff catchers. And we can increase that mistake by folding more of these, which costs them value with the top of their range. These nutted hands will get called less and therefore their value will decrease. Conversely, let's say they're bluffing too much. They're putting in all of these bluffs. Well, in that case, all of our top pair and probably even some King X is going to have pot odds to call. So we can increase their mistake by decreasing the value of their bluffs by calling more. And I understand this is a very, very simple example. I promise you guys, it does get a little more complex throughout the lecture. Uh, I want to start simple so that a wide range audience can understand this. And we're going to move to more sophisticated examples later in the lecture. I should also note that I'm not using any particular format. You see, I've used cash, spin and go. We'll use a variety of formats throughout this lecture as this theory applies to all formats. So now that we understand some of the basics of exploitation, let's talk about the terminology. Now, there are essentially two main types of exploits. We've got reactive versus proactive exploits. Reactive means adjusting after your opponent has already deviated. Proactive means anticipating their mistake and changing your strategy beforehand. And both types are useful and can be used. Let's talk about nemesis strategies next. Nemesis strategy is a term from game theory, and it essentially means a maximally exploitative strategy. This is one that will perfectly counter all of your opponent's mistakes throughout the entire game tree. You are playing the perfect nemesis strategy to their strategy. Conversely, we can talk about minimally exploitative strategies, or min yes. And I think this was first coined in Modern Poker Theory by Acevedo. This is a strategy that assumes your opponent make a mistake on one specific node and they'll play perfectly everywhere else. 
And the reason this distinction is required is because multi-street node locks are not really commercially available. They're very hard to do correctly with any tool. So what we typically do is start with just locking one street, for example, their flop C bets or their river check raise one node, and we'll see how the strategy adjusts to just that one node mistake. These are less risky because it assumes your opponent can counter your strategy on later streets if you're not careful, and they tend to lead to more robust exploits that take on less risk. So let's move on to some common misunderstandings. Some people will say GTO is only good against other GTO players. And this argument is just silly. A GTO is the best strategy in a vacuum without reads. It assumes your competition is competent enough to punish blunders. So as a funny little analogy, I myself am a chess player. And if you're playing an exploitative style here on your chess game, you might think, okay, I'm going to move my queen to h5. And then on my next move, I'm going to take this pawn on f7 and checkmate their king supported by this bishop. But a GTO player will look at this and say, no, this strategy is exploitable because the knight can simply take the queen right? And so the other thing GTO does that's important to recognize is it prevents you from making massive blunders. So some people say you should never play GTO in a low stakes game. While it's true that exploitative strategies have more potential to gain versus weaker opponents, those weaker opponents will also make more pure mistakes against the GTO strategy. Both are winning against weaker opponents. It's just a matter of how much they're winning by. And as I said, understanding GTO enhances your exploitative capabilities. What's your baseline? How are you exploiting if you can't recognize their imbalances? Now, exploitative players might have some of their own misunderstandings, but so do GTO players. In fact, a lot of GTO players believe this myth that GTO gains any time the opponent deviates. There's this concept of passive exploitation, meaning that your fixed GTO strategy gains simply because your opponent isn't also playing GTO. However, it's important to realize that GTO only gains against certain types of mistakes. We call these pure mistakes. It does not gain any money from frequency mistakes. That is to say, your opponent can deviate from the GTO strategy and it won't make you money. And in fact, given enough rake, it can actually cost you money in some spots. This is a really important point, guys. And this, I think, underlines a lot of this lecture. So how does GTO make money then? Well, like I said, it makes money through pure mistakes. Here we have a blind versus blind situation. Small blind has bet two on this queen jack five flop, and we're on the big blind with nine H here. Now, with this hand, if we were to shove all in or fold, that is a pure mistake that strictly loses EV, even if the small blind does not adapt to exploit our strategy. However, if we call, raise seven, or raise 12, these actions are indifferent meaning that they don't lose EV against a fixed GTO strategy. In fact, you could raise 100% of your 9-8 here, and you wouldn't lose EV as long as you raise to appropriate size. You wouldn't lose EV so long as small blind wouldn't adjust. And this is true for all indifferent hands. I'm going to get back to that point for a moment, but first I want to talk about fixed versus dynamic strategies. So I've mentioned these words fixed and dynamic earlier. A fixed strategy simply means your opponent will not adjust how they play, or you will not adjust how you play. Now, GTO is by definition a fixed strategy. It's always going to play its range the same way in the same spot. Now, sure, it'll adjust on different textures and against different bet sizes and such, but it's not going to adjust to its opponent. A dynamic strategy is one that adjusts based on the opposition. And most humans play a dynamic strategy or somewhere in between fixed and dynamic. People tend to play closer to a fixed strategy when they're playing fast fold, zoom games, multi-tabling, and they play more dynamic when they can zone in on their opponents, such as non-anonymous games or heads up games. So here we have a board 1055. And this one here is an MTT solution, 40 big blinds deep, button open big blind call, actions on us. I'm looking at the strategy plus expected value for all hands in the range. And we can see that pretty much everything's mixed. In fact, I'm going to change this over to horizontal view, which shows every combination in range. I'm even going to group the bet sizes to make it simpler. It's either bet or check. We'll make it really easy. We'll notice that king seven here will either bet or check. And both of these have the same expected value. And this is true of all mixed hands. At least it ought to be true. Now, in practice, solvers aren't solved to perfect accuracy. So sometimes we see small deviations. For example, this ace eight hand is you know, 0 0.01 better as a bet than a check. If it were solved to perfect accuracy, these two, by definition, would have the exact same EV. That is a hard law of Nash equilibrium. So what does this mean? Well, 
let's imagine we took every single mixed hand in range, which happens to be the entire range. And we just pure bet all of this. And let's imagine Big Blind does not adapt their strategy. Big Blind is a GTO bot. They just play the fixed GTO strategy. They will not adapt. Will button gain? The answer is no. The answer is their EV will remain the same as long as they don't blunder on future streets, that is. Now, in practice, it's very difficult to play a range bet correctly and then not blunder on a future street. They'll probably have to check back a ton. Uh, a lot of people, they'll just range bets and they don't realize that when they do that, they have to check back like 70% on the turn. But anyway, I'm getting off track here. The point is, every single one of these hands could bet against the GTO bot without losing anything. And conversely, every single one of these hands could pure check 100% again, without losing any EV against the GTO strategy. And so this is what I mean by fixed versus dynamic strategies. Now, if we imagine that the big blind was dynamic, meaning they could adjust to our strategy when we bet, that could lose a ton of money. Range betting here could be punished by a ton of check raising, more calling, less folding, and range checking could be exploited by big blind checking more and playing more defensively on the turn. And so, even though range betting or range checking is exploitable, the GTO strategy will not gain from those adjustments. You need to be able to adapt your range in the big line to exploit a button range bet or a button range check. Now, you may think that this lack of ability to gain from indifferent hands is just a property of GTO, but it's not. In fact, this is a property of all fixed strategies. Any strategy that is unable to adjust cannot gain from indifferent mixing mistakes that your opponent makes. Whether it be GTO or just some random garbage you're playing, they're going to have indifferent hands in their range, and those hands can play however they like as long as they're indifferent between those actions and will not lose. So this is not just about GTO. This is about fixed versus dynamic strategies. Understanding that, we can move on again to how GTO actually makes money. And like I said before, there are mixing mistakes and pure mistakes. Now, a mixing mistake is anything with incorrect frequencies, like we saw in that last example, a range bet where they should be mixing. These are exploitable by an adaptive opponent, but they are not punished by fixed strategies. And again, GTO is a type of fixed strategy. Pure mistakes are taking any action that strictly loses EV against the opponent's strategy, even if they don't adjust. And so it's really important to recognize these two types of mistakes. One is a blunder. The other is something that's punished only if your opponent adapts to punish it. And their adaptation doesn't even have to be intentional. They could just be playing their natural strategy. You know, say you're a little bluff heavy playing a calling station. Their natural tendencies can exploit yours in that sense. Okay, let's move on to a toy game experiment. So the remainder of this lecture is going to focus on examples. I'm going to start with a toy game and we're going to move progressively to real spots and more sophisticated exploits as we go along. So far, everything's been basically just the fundamentals. So for those of you who stuck with it, prepare for the more complicated stuff. Let's start with this simple toy game. It is a polarized versus bluff catcher toy game. The stack to pot ratio is one. In other words, one player has either the pure nuts or pure bluff, and the other player has a bluff catcher. We're on the river, so the polarized player is in position. Here's an example. Hero either has ace-ace or queen-queen at equal frequency. Villain has king-king, and the board is 3-3-3-2-2. Three, 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 deuce, deuce. The pot is $10, and the stack is $10. So let's start by just solving this simple toy game. And the way to do that is just using pure math. Uh, now, if you don't like math, we've made this handy little chart you can use to understand some basic toy game concepts and basic GTO mathematics. So it's a pot-sized bet. That means that for a pot-sized bet, we need to lay 33% pot odds. Another way to say this is we're laying two to one. This means we lay two value for every one bluff. So if we want to bet all of our ace-ace, 100% ace-ace, that means we want to bet half as many bluffs. 50% of our queen-queen will bet, and then we're going to check back with 50% queen-queen as well, okay? So how should the opponent defend? Well, against a pot-sized bet, they should call according to the minimum defense frequency, 50%. The reason they do this is to make our bluffs indifferent. They want to make our queen-queen indifferent between betting and checking. So king-king calls... 50% of the time, and that is the solution to this toy game. You can also take a look at the value to bluff construction for a pot-sized bet. It is two-thirds value, one-third bluff, which is exactly what we have here. 
So how does that play out? Well, Hero's Ace Ace will always bet because it's the nuts. And so the expected value is going to be the pot plus half of villain stack because they call half the time. So 10 plus 5, $15. Queen Queen will win half the time, lose half the time when it bets, and it always loses when it checks back. Its expected value is $0. The total expected value when you average these out is 7.5. King King, on the other hand, is $0 facing a bet. However, it always wins when we check back with Queen Queen. And since we're checking back 25% of our range, King King wins $2.5 or 25% of the pot. So this is the GTO solution if both players play correctly. But who cares about toy games? I want to test your guys' understanding of what happens when one of these players deviates. So Hero shoves with a perfectly balanced range, as described earlier, two-thirds value, one-third bluff. Who gains if villain always faults? Who gains if villain always calls? Take a moment to consider your answer. And keep in mind, Hero will not adjust to these tendencies. The answer is that no one gains. And this is because, again, Hero does not adjust to these tendencies. If villain's always folding, of course, they should bluff more, and if villain's always calling, they should stop bluffing. But because this is a mixing mistake, a frequency mistake, and not a pure mistake, well, you don't actually gain anything. How does that play out? Well, let's take a look at the expected value. The EV of Ace Ace is now $10. It always wins the pot, but it never wins fill in stack because they don't call. They're calling 0% in this example. The EV of Queen Queen is $5 because they always win the pot when they bet, but they're still checking back half the time. They're not adjusting to exploit this overfull. So the total EV is exactly as it was before, $7.5. Now, King King, on the other hand, it again, it's never calling, but Queen Queen is still going to check back half the time, which means a quarter of the time King King will win the pot. Therefore, the EV remains exactly the same. Now, what if villain always calls? Well, now the expected value from Ace Ace increases from $10 to $20 because they're always winning villain's call, but the expected value of queens decreases to negative $5 because we're not getting any faults. These two, again, will average out such that the total expected value is still $7.5. King King, on the other hand, still wins $2.5 because, again, Queen Queen checks back half the time. They're not adjusting. Okay, let's try a different example. Let's say that Villain always defends 50% of their range, no matter what. Who gains if Hero always bluffs? They just bet all of their Queen Queen and all of their Ace Ace. Who gains if Hero never bluffs? They bet all of their Ace Ace, none of their Queens. Take a moment to consider your answer. Again, the answer is no one wins. The EV remains exactly the same. So what does that look like? Well, again, we can just consider how often villain is calling. So here we say we always bluff. Now, if villain is calling 50%, the EV of queens does not change, right? They're going to win half the time. They're going to lose half the time when they bet. And therefore, the EV is still zero. Again, ace ace, the EV is $15 because... Half of the time, they're going to win Villain's Call, and they always win the pot. Total EV is 7.5. Villain, on the other hand, actually, they're going to win whenever they call, at least at some percentage, because queens are over-bluffing in this spot. Therefore, the total expected value is still 2.5. So the EV does not change regardless. And now we can say, what happens if Hero never bluffs? We always check back Queen Queen. Well, again, Aces doesn't change because Kings is calling at the same frequency. And Queens is zero EV as a check back anyway. And so regardless, it's the same expected value, 7.5 versus 2.5. And if you don't believe me, you can plug this toy game into any solver and see it for yourself. All right, so let's go on to example two here. And I've got six examples total. So this one is a spin and go example. Let's bring it up here. I brought this one up earlier, I think. Yeah, I did. On ace nine nine, where we bet small on the flop, we bet pot on the turn, and then we get to river. The run out is ace nine nine five deuce. And so the strategy here is to play something polarized using trips and a little bit of top pair plus for value and using these hands as bluffs. So this is very similar to that toy game we just looked at where it was, you know, 
ace ace and queen queen versus king king in this case you've got the value the ace ace and the bluffs now before we looked at what happens if no one adjusts and we saw that no one gained but now let's look and see what happens if people adjust so let me bring this up in pio solver we've got some cool stuff here okay so they check and we can see their range is mostly going to be top pair a few trips and some king high and again we're betting with most of our value and all of this stuff now let's change one thing let's node lock queen jack so that it always bets just queen jack nothing else we'll leave everything else exactly the same and we'll let villain adapt to exploit us so queen jack goes from i'll just show you the difference here from betting you know maybe half the time total to always betting everything else remains exactly the same right i haven't touched any other hand in this range just one hand well in the gto solution the original baseline when we bet of course they're going to call all of their trips this is a shove by the way what is it 80 percent they're going to call all of their trips and they're indifferent with their ASEX. So, you know, all of these ASEX hands are going to be mixing calls and folds and they're going to try and call enough that such that we can't exploit them. Now let's go back to the other one here. This one, all I've done is change queen jack, nothing else. We chove and now they're just range calling. <laughs> all of the ASEX, all of the trips, all of the king high are suddenly pure calls, right? Huge difference. And in fact, the betting frequency didn't change much. It goes from like 55 to 58% total. We're, we're barely touching this. And the truth is that equilibrium is extremely fragile, especially in these polarized spots on the river. Let me bring this back up again. When we shove here, actually I'm going to bring this up here. So when we shove, I'm going to bring up this equity graph. This blue line represents big blinds range right and all of these this long flat blue line that is their indifference region these are hands that are indifferent between calling and folding that includes ace five as well as some king high and everything in between right and of course they've got some strong hands like you know trips that are what to call this green line represents buttons distribution so they've got nutted hands and they've got bluffs and a few mergey ace high bets and so what happens is if you shift the amount of bluffs or the amount of value just very slightly, all of a sudden you're not laying the correct pot odds for your bet size. And this long flat blue line will shift into either a range call or a range fold, right? So let me bring up another example here. What if they under bluff? Check. And the, again, the only thing I've changed is just queen jack. Everything else is the same. And so I've changed it from mixing about half the time to a pure check. So now we're under bluffing. We're not bluffing enough. And when we bet, only trips calls. All of the ace high folds because this long flat blue line has now shifted down just ever so slightly into the pure fold range. They're not getting the correct pot odds. So this is the baseline. And this is what it looks like when we're under bluffing by about 2%. So you can see solvers are just ruthless, right? They are clairvoyant. They know exactly what their equity is and they know exactly what pot odds they need to call and how much money a call will make or lose. They don't actually calculate pot odds, by the way. They just calculate EV. And it knows that calling is going to be lower EV than folding. And so the next point, I also ran, for example, the next level on top of this is okay let's assume that you're playing a real game and you're playing the big blind in this spot and you think your opponent is too value heavy so you fold everything but trips all of your ace high because you think they're under bluffing well how exploitable is this adjustment well i'm not going to go through every solve because i have other stuff i want to get to before the end of this lecture but i can show you this spreadsheet here where i just figured out the ev so in this case how much does out of position gain when we over bluff and they overfold? They gain about 4.9 out of a pot of 195. 
how much does out of position gain when they uh when we under bluff and they overfold they gain about 2.6 so very small gains because we're just making very small changes however we can also calculate the counter exploitability so that is to say if we know that for example they're going to fold way over fold how much can this strategy be countered for and that can be countered for a lot of money about 39 out of 195 because it'll just start bluffing everything if it thinks you're going to overfold and similarly if it thinks you're going to overcall like in uh this example here if it thinks that this is what's going to happen well it can gain considerably by just not bluffing and owning you with value bets and so these extreme adjustments the solver makes are to try and gain just a tiny amount of ev but the risk you take in making such a drastic change to your strategy opens up the potential to be counter exploited for exponentially more than you gain in the first place right like for example you're trying to gain this 4.9 but if your opponent then counter exploits you you can lose 34. so you need to be quite sure of your read to try and exploit very subtle imbalances like this um especially on the river in a spot like this let's move on to example three here we've got a donking spot i love these spots so it's button opens big blind calls and the flop is 764 rainbow now this is a board that the big blind should donk often let's just take a quick glance at the gto strategy so here we can see that the big blind bets third pot with two-thirds of their range they are leading out a ton here betting into the pre-flop aggressor why do we think it is that the big blind wants to donk so often is it A, they have a nut advantage, B, a range advantage, C, to prevent Button from checking back too much, or D, to keep Button on their toes? Take a moment to consider your answer. The correct answer is C, to prevent Button from checking back too much. Now, true, the reason they have the ability to donk in the first place is because they have a nut advantage and that ties into it. But the way that Button can exploit a pure check here is by checking back more. Let me show you what I mean. What would happen if Big Blind never donks? Let's load up this solution. So here we have the simple solutions. These are designed without flop donks, so Big Blind no longer has the option to lead out. When Big Blind checks, Button exploits that by checking back more often. We can see them checking 90.7% of their range. But let's just take a moment to compare the range advantages. So as I said, the reason it does have the ability to donk comes down to the fact that they have more nutted hands. Let me bring that up here. They're going to have more sets, straights, and two pair. And I'll just maximize that for a moment. We can see that they have more of these in range proportionally compared to button. Furthermore, they have a lot of draws and overall the low cards just hit their range better. We can see this reflected in the equity distribution. Uh, normally, blue line should be underneath the green line indicating a range advantage for button given they have all the overpairs. But that range advantage is neutralized on this kind of flop. And furthermore, there is a nut advantage near the top, which allows them to lead aggressively. So to exploit this, if big blind range checks, if big blind does not have a donking range, button can simply check back a ton. And the reason this works is because you're blunting big blinds nut advantage. They're going to get less value with the top of their range, right? Now let's just compare that to the one where donks are allowed. In this case, they're going to lead out a lot, and even when they check, they've weakened their checking range, and therefore a button should bet more frequently. I'll just ungroup these. And so Big Blind is generating more money in the pot in both lines, in both the checking line and the betting line. And so the way to exploit, for example, a range better in the spot, like let's just imagine that button just bets everything when checked to on 764, or they, not even everything, we'll just say they bet more than this amount, than 40% of their range for this size. Maybe they use a bigger size or bet more frequently. If that's the case, Big Blind's best move is actually to range check and let Button make a mistake and then hit them with aggressive check raises and wide calls. So the exploit 
Button can make is a range check. Button over-realizes their equity and costs us value in the big blind. Now, people will always say, oh, you know, it's about getting money with the nutted hands and such, and that's true, but you have to approach these spots from the standpoint of why does the solver do the thing? Well, if it doesn't do the thing, the opponent can exploit them by doing this. And so if big blind does not dog in this board, button can exploit them by checking more. If button range bets this board, big blind can exploit them by check raising more. And so there are always these exploitative dynamics that are at play that create the GTO strategy. Let's take a look at this next example here. Uh, this next one is going to look at preflop strategies, and this one's a little more nuanced. We're going to compare two hijack opening ranges. One are the general solutions, and in these solutions, every position is able to call your open. Next, we'll look at the simple solutions, and in these ones, only big blind can call. Small blind, button, and cutoff must use a three bet or fold strategy. So how will this change hijack's strategy? So here we have the general solutions, and we can see that after hijack opens, cutoff can call, button can call, small blind can call, big blind can call. The overall range is opening 21.6%. Let's compare that to the simple solutions. Here, it's opening 24.4%. And when they open, cutoff, button, small blind must all use raise fold strategies. They don't have the option to call, only big blind can call. So why is that? Again, let's just do a side-by-side -side comparison. We can see that the opening frequency increases by about 3% when people do not have the option to call and instead use raise fold strategies. And we can think of a number of potential theories for why this might happen. For example, we can say that if our opponents are using a raise fold strategy, perhaps we need more board coverage in hijack, or perhaps uh, we can't be punished by calls as much. Maybe we have better implied odds versus the big blind in the simple solutions, and therefore we can call wider. Maybe it's just got something to do with the fact that big blind is more likely to call. Which of these do you think is the correct answer? Take a moment and consider your answer. The correct answer is B, they cannot be punished with calls as much. This is to do with the fact that the opponents can only raise so many hands before they themselves become exploitable. They can create a more sophisticated defense by employing a calling strategy that will force hijack to open tighter. All of these mixed hands, right? in the simple solutions won't be able to open as wide if the opponents can exploit us using two actions rather than one. So again, it always comes down to why does the solver do the thing? Because if it didn't do the thing, the opponent could exploit them by doing X. Or conversely, in this case, we've taken away our opponent's ability to exploit us through calls, and therefore the optimal strategy adjusts to open wider. So this one is button versus big blind turn over bet. These are really fun lines. You guys will like this one. So this is a spot where we open on the button. It's a 100 big blind cash game at 500 NL rake structure. Flop is ace, king, three. Now, what a lot of people do on, you know, high card, high card, low card kind of boards is they'll just range bet small. But the solver actually prefers an over bet on these boards, which I'm sure most of the advanced players will know. And the reason for that is because you can actually gain more with your nutted hands, with your stronger hands, your strong top pair and such, with an overbet strategy. And part of the reason is because big blind just does not have enough nutted hands to counter you. Like if you just look at all the two pair plus, that accounts for 1.9% of big blind's range. They just don't have enough strong hands, even top pair hands, they just don't have enough of to counter an overbet strategy. So instead of range betting small, the solver prefers to overbet on this board, get more value at the top of its range. And as a result, a lot of the weaker hands have to now go into the check line. The truth is that any strategy will print on this board. As long as you're putting in money, this should be really good for the button's range. So button overbets, big blind calls, and we get a three of diamonds. Now, one interesting feature you can try here is you can open up these turn reports and see how the big blind should play across different turn cards. I'm gonna just view that as a graph in chart mode. And we can see that the big blind actually donks when the flush completes quite often. They'll also donk on a king sometimes. 
And the reason for that is because the ranges are quite imbalanced after this overbet. Button's range, sorry, big blind's range will be more condensed towards, um, you know, made hands and draws. So they'll have more flush draws, combo draws, as well as more hands like second pair. Like button doesn't overbet second pair on the flop, but big blind does call second pair. So I've chosen the three of diamonds as a turn card. It's kind of a brick. And on this card, button should continue with another 125% overbet. This is the standard strategy. And we they do this with strong top pair plus, right? As well as trips, sets, boats, stuff like that. And they do continue to bluff with a variety of bluffs. I'm going to put that in horizontal mode, mostly bluffs containing a spade. So here's a question for you guys, and this will be the last poll of the lecture. How often should Button give up on the river, on average, across all possible runouts, after they've overbet 125% and big blind calls? Take a moment to consider your answer. So what are we at? Very, very split decision here. Um, we have every answer split down the middle here. Most people saying give up more often. Some people saying never give up. Some people saying give up, you know, 25 or 35% of your range. And there's a really easy trick to calculate this. Simply calculate, uh, I should add, this only works in really polarized lines, like the one we're looking at here, where we're going over bet, over bet. This won't work so well in depolarized spots, but in spots like this, you should give up with whatever pot odds you're laying on the turn. So 125%, they need to call 125 to win, and the pot will be 125 plus 125 plus 100% pots. So the pot odds are 35%, basically. So they should give up with about 35% of their range on the river in order to make big blinds in different floats indifferent. Now, this is kind of a confusing concept, but... Uh, let me start with this little calculator here. Now, I call this my caveman GTO calculator. If you guys want to play around with this, just send me a DM afterwards. I just gave this one out. So this is based on some basic toy game math. We assume that equity is static, hero is balanced, no blocker effects, and villain can only call or fault. And what it allows you to do is just enter stuff in here. So we'll say that on the turn, our bluffs have 20%, our value has 80%, and how much is behind after we bet? It's about a pot size shove. So you can enter you know, any amount in here and it's gonna adjust stuff. Now, under this exact toy game, what ends up happening is we should be using a range containing about 40% uh, value, 60% bluffs on the turn and then giving up with a portion of our bluffs on the river such that their calls are indifferent, right? On the river, using a pot size shove, of course, the equity will change. It'll be slightly different because either our bluffs will hit or they won't. But the river, you want to use an appropriate value bluff ratio. So let's see what Pio thinks. Let me bring up Pio Silver here. Okay, so I've resolved this in Pio. Okay, so we check. We're overbetting, and they call. And I'll just hit, choose any river. I'm going to choose what's called a hotness report. That's going to give me a report for the entire river. Oh, you know what? I better select check. Strategy on the river. After we've checked. Is to give up about 35% of the time across all possible rivers in total. Now, of course, the frequency changes depending on the exact card and suits and how well it hits our ranges. But overall, it's giving up such that big blinds floats are indifferent between calling or folding on the turn, right? Now, what old school poker logic would have you believe is that you should set up your betting ranges such that you're always going to barrel on the river, right? You don't just overbet, overbet, and then give up. No, why would you do that? But the truth is that's exactly what you should be doing. And if you're not doing that, one of two things will happen. Either, either you need to use a tighter range on the turn, 
such that you have the right value to bluff ratio on the river. And if you do that, you're under bluffing. And how do we exploit that as the big blind? Well, you don't call. <laughs> you raise your trips and you fold everything else. So this is what happens when we're under bluffing with a ratio that can basically always bet the river when called. Um, the alternative is that you use a balanced range on the turn and then you over bluff the river, right? You're not giving up enough, therefore you must be over bluffing. In which case, the exploit is to just call down super wide with bluff catchers. And so consider what your opponents are actually doing in game. Are they actually going to give up you know, a third of their range after overbetting the turn. Because if not, your static bluff catchers probably shouldn't be calling. Or if they're over bluffing, your static bluff catchers should always be calling. And so we can see it creates these very imbalanced strategies. This is why the solver will give up with a portion of its range after taking this line. So in conclusion, to solve the question, why does the solver do X? Answer the question, because if it didn't do X, the opponent can exploit them by doing Y. This question and answer is fundamental to both GTO and exploitative strategies. Answering this question is absolutely required to understand the why behind GTO strategies. I see a lot of players, they'll come in, they'll try and memorize every frequency, they'll look at hands instead of strategies, they'll look at you know, one combo instead of the bigger picture, which is a waste of time. You should be looking at the overall strategy rather than zoning in on some exact frequency, because the truth is that some exact frequency doesn't matter in a vacuum. It's about the overall strategy pair, right? And conversely, if you're playing an exploitative style, you need to be considering how you can be counter-exploited so that you can look out for that. You need to be answering this question and you need to be doing so proactively instead of just exploiting on uh, on autopilot, right? Also consider, as an exploitative player, how much your strategy can be counter-exploited for. We saw in an earlier example that, you know, if you just fold a ton versus their river bet, well, you can gain a little bit if they're too bluff heavy, but you can also lose a lot uh, if they counter-exploit you. So every, every exploit you make can be counter-exploited for more than you can originally gain. Important to keep that in mind. Uh, so that concludes my lecture. Do you guys have any questions about anything here today? <laughs> Matthew asks, thanks for the talk. Do you advice on methodology to find exploits versus the field? So that'll come down to some, what we call mass data analysis. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this video here. <laughs> There's so much theory, I am lost in the forest. Uh, I know it can seem like a lot. I kind of start my lectures so that they're uh, more friendly to a wide variety of players to start with and they get more and more advanced as I progress. So it can get a little bit confusing near the end. But uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free to DM me or just reach out in the Discord chat. We're happy to discuss the theory there. All right, guys, that's all. If you want a copy of that Caveman GTO spreadsheet, just send me a, a message on Discord and I can send it to you there. I would like to thank all of you for coming out. We had a really great turnout today. Lots of participants. You guys were great. Thank you so much for coming. Happy grinding. <laughs>